talk today is, is really Bruno's idea, and, and I thank him for that, which was, why don't you give a talk on um, the, the debate between Carl Rose and Lynn Marvelous, both of whom are, are great friends of mine. Carl Rose is also dying at the moment of uh, uh, pancreatic cancer, and I was just with him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but these are really great scientists who promoted the microbial world and disagreed over methods, um, classification, and but had a deep appreciation for the microbial, um, the microbial earth. What we'll see, uh, what I thought I should do though, is to take you through the history of um, sort of a historical outline of the story about kingdoms to contextualize that debate over five kingdoms later on in the uh, latter part of the 20th century and early 21st century. So I want to back right up and talk about um, where microbes, microbes place in the history of science per se. So that, that's what I thought I would do. So uh, again, this is Bruno's idea, but, but uh, uh, so anything goes bad, we blame him. Um, Darwinism, neo-Darwinism for Dorian, is a sterile conception of evolution. It was, an evolu it was a story about evolution of plants and animals over the last 450 million years. It was a world of two kingdoms, plants and animals. That was the basic dichotomy, and I'll talk a lot about that. And the question, the principal question for neo-Darwinians was uh, the origin of species. So what's left out? The first 3.5 billion years of evolution, the microbial world that represents the greatest biomass and greatest uh, diversity, biochemical diversity on Earth, left out of evolution. Nothing about the origin of kingdoms, where do kingdoms come from? Nothing about the origin of organisms and cells, genetic code, and cellular complexity. And that's really, to my mind, the story of, of microbial evolutionary biology and symbiosis. So let's start with Linnaeus. Linnaeus had, of course, three kingdoms, plants, animals, and minerals, or rocks, and he put all microbes into one species, which he called chaos infusorium. He had a great sense of humor. Great sense of humor. And this, um, Lamarck was really, I think, the first great phylogeneticist, you know, or had a great, in terms of big tree, in terms of a tree of life. Lamarck thought that there are two processes operating in nature. Uh, one is the tendency of ever-increasing complexity, from simple to complex, and the other are the branches of that tree. And he thought these things were due to different forces. He thought he could o classify, according to the, uh, in terms of a hierarchy of organisms, from simple to complex, based on what he called the essential system systems of organs. And he could see the, that essential system in the higher taxa, families, and, but not genera or species. The, and, and that for whatever led to uh, uh, organisms from simple to complex, he didn't know what the mechanism of that was. Then there were branches on the tree, the difference between different birds, or the, the long neck of a giraffe. Well, those things were, were adaptations. They had nothing to do with increased complexity, and those were due to the inheritance of acquired characteristics, primarily. Darwin argued similarly, that all true classification, he said, is genealogical. That community of descent is the hidden bond which naturalists have been unconsciously seeking, not some unknown plan of creation, or the enunciation of general propositions and the mere putting together and separation of objects more or less alike. And he talked about how astronomers uh, name planets in, in, a, in a curious way. But, uh, but classification had to be evolutionary, really, in terms of evolutionary relationships. Darwin, of course, as I said, didn't talk about the big tree of life in the origin, by definition of the title. But, that, but he did see the tree, uh, he was thinking in terms of trees in a bifurcated tree. And this is the only figure, of course, in, in the origin of species, of that bifurcating tree of species. To construct genealogical trees of great size and scope, Darwin argued similarly that one had to compare the essential characters. The essential characters, as Owen called them. And he writes, it, it, it may even be given as a general rule that the less any part of the organization is concerned with special habits, the more important it becomes for classification. And he said embryological characters are the most important, most valuable, valuable of all. So you had to have, so he's thinking of, just as Lamarck was, of, highly preserved characteristics, highly conserved um, characteristics that don't respond to the vicissitudes of life, that are hidden deep within the organism. And in this letter to Huxley in 1857, he writes, the time will come, I believe, 
though I shall not live to see it, when we shall have very fairly true genealogical trees of each great kingdom of nature. Darwin said little about microbes. You know, there's this famous statement in the, in the origin, there's grandeur in this view of life with the several powers having been originally breathed into a few or into one. Some places in the origin, Darwin thought there was one uh, organism, in other places he thought, as he did here in the concluding lines, that maybe life uh, evolved more than once. The real issue is no one knew. No one knew. And no one knew until very recently. There's lots of talk about kingdoms, but kingdoms were really on the periphery of, of science. Richard Owen, in his book Paleontology, uh, promotes protozoa to a kingdom. A lot of people didn't like, you know, uh, Jonathan Ho John Hogg didn't like that term protozoa because it was too zoocentric. He said, surely there's protophyta in there too. So he wanted a more neutral word they called uh, primogenium. And, and Hogg uh, was a creationist. These were his. First, the first uh, uh, creatures of creation, or the first organisms of creation. Others in the United States and Pennsylvania, Casson and Wilson, argue for another kingdom of Primalia. I'm not going to mention all the kingdoms. There's lots of talk about kingdoms, but I'm not going to talk about all of them in this talk. Just enough to uh, give some sort of context to understand uh, the debate that ensues uh, later on with molecular phylogenetics. Ernst Haeckel. Jim thinks he's a bad scientist, I think he's a great one. Um, this is his first big tree in general morphology of 1866. And, and Haeckel makes a, a new kingdom, Protista, and within it there'd be Protophyta and Protozoa. And there'd also be this new thing, that this new organization that he called Monera, Monera. And these creatures, he thought, would um, bridge the gap between life and non-life. They would lack chromatin that other organisms have. Later on, monera takes on a different meaning as a membrane, as something lacking a membrane-bound nucleus. But that's not what Heckel meant. This was more like an organism, pre-cellular entities, as he called them. But any thought, what, would, what they would represent is blue-green algae, of course, cyanobacteria, and bacteria. The way in which one determined relationships was based on, uh, for animals, comparative anatomy, comparative embryology, and the fossil record. Well, all those things were lacking for microbes. Up to the 1960s, there's very little um, microbial uh, uh, fossil record. The f microbes have the greatest diversity physiologically on Earth, but their strategy was to diversify physiologically and metabolically. In terms of morphology, they're rather simple. Big multicellulars like us are pretty complex morphologically, but very simple biochemically, if we stripped ourselves from the microbes that comprise us. So it wasn't possible to distinguish between analogy and homology, what the essential characteristics of organisms were, what were adaptations, and what, 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 what were highly conserved characteristics. So life could have emerged once or many times. Again, no one knew. Pasteur typically referred to microbes as microbes. That was it, you know, didn't really care. Um, sometimes he called them germs, and sometimes they were referred to as viruses. And bacteria, which primarily it came to fame uh, as pathogens, right? I mean, they study disease, and they were uh, basically the, the uh, object of biomedical investigation. In universities, biology, uh, uh, bacteria were the domain of botanists, and they were considered plants. The schizophyta, the schizomycetes, the fission fungi. Medicos today will still talk about the floor in your gut. They think there are little flowers in there. <laughs> but so they stayed like that as little plants for a long time. Breaking the plant animal dichotomy was very, very difficult, as we'll see. Um, bacterial classification remained in chaos um, throughout the 20th century. In Berge's manual, uh, bacteria were classified in terms of morphology, physiology, staining reactions, pathologicity. But basically, microbes had no evolution, they had no history, they weren't brought into the evolutionary fold. And again, one didn't know what these traits were, they were conserved and which ones were adaptive. And this is Robert Breed in 1928. A review of the literature will show that the most popular term that has been used to describe systematic bacteriology is chaos. And this irrespective of the period of history under consideration. <laughs> when people did talk about the, uh, breaking the plant animal, um, dichotomy. It was done anonymously. It was an anonymous letter written in science, and then Erwin Copeland, after he retires, 
uh, he was uh, teaching in the Philippines, and then comes back and writes his paper in science talking about anonymous people who want to claim that actually there are more than two kingdoms. And he says, and a plant kingdom comprised of all the organisms listed in the text of botanical taxonomy is no more natural than a kingdom of stones. Copeland went on to assure his readers, and it's a letter, that botanists could still study bacteria. You know, that it wasn't going to upset the social order. Of course, he knew that it would, because those, those kingdoms were a reflection of the institutional order of biology itself. Right? So he was very concerned about, uh, about that. His son, Herbert Copeland, again, off the beaten tra track in Sacramento Junior College, in 1938 proposes four kingdoms. And he has the Monera of Heckle, but now he's defining it differently as uh, non-membrane bound cells. He has Protoctista, the Metaphyta, and the Metazoa. The problem with these, these uh, four kingdoms was that no one really knew what bacteria were. And I'll talk about that in a second. After the Second World War, bacteria come to center stage in biology. But they come into biology as domesticates. Right? Domesticates in, in laboratories for us to study ourselves, the nature of genes, and the nature of gene action. And molecular biologists, of course, were no more interested, generally speaking, in the natural history of bacteria than, say, a Drosophila geneticist was interested in entomology. Right? They're objects to be used, or tools to be used. And again, microbiologists of the, uh, of the decades following the Second World War, who founded molecular biology, know, knew no more about the relationships among those organisms than microbiologists did in the days of Pasteur. The problem with Copeland's scheme was this. It was very difficult for people to distinguish morphologically between a blue-green algae, which are quite complicated, and, and what, what later called and other regular cells, the cells that comprise our bodies, say, which are called eukaryotes um, earlier. It was very difficult to distinguish between rickettsia and very, uh, and, and very large viruses. The distinction was blurry. No one knew how to do this. It was a big debate about whether or not bacteria had uh, mitosis, uh, bacteria such as blue-green algae. In, 1850, in 1957, André Wolf at the Institute Pasteur, writes a paper called The Concept of a Virus. And he distinguishes a virus from, other, from being cells by saying they, they are composed of DNA or RNA, never both, and they don't have translation machinery. And they're not cells. After a lengthy paper, about 80 pages, Wolf co concludes a virus is a virus. Right? It's something very different. Four years later, Roger Stania and C.B. Van Neel write a sister paper to Wolf's called The Concept of a Bacterium. Stania had been at the Institute Pasteur on sabbatical with Wolf um, and learns these words eukaryote and prokaryote from Wolf's professor, Edouard Chaton. But in 62, part of 62, I should point out, Stania and Van Neel were holdouts. They held out for a microbial classification that was based on evolutionary relationships. And they thought they may be able to do this by morphology, and it was almost platonic. They said that simplest microbe was a sphere, and then it would get more and more complex morphologically. Then by the middle of the century, they abandoned it, and they said it's impossible. We will never understand the microbial relationships of these bacteria. And we still don't know what a bacterium is. Nobel Prizes are being awarded uh, you know, uh, uh, annually to molecular biologists studying bacteria, but the microbiologists aren't getting uh, much of the tech. But Stanley and Van Neel write this paper in 62, and they begin by saying that this is a scandal of bacteriology. Any good biologist finds it intellectually distressing to devote his life to the study of a group that cannot be readily and satisfactorily defined in biological terms. And the abiding intellectual scandal of bacteriology has been the absence of a clear conception of a bacterium. So they borrow these words from Chaton, a uh, Vos professor. Eukaryotes would be cells that had a membrane-bound nucleus, that divided by mitosis. They had a cytoskeleton, and they had um, mitochondria, and in the case of plants, as, uh, chloroplasts as well. Prokaryotes were defined negatively. These were creatures that lacked those structures. 
The problem with the negative class, the problem with this classification, which again, I'll just give you the heads up on, is that indeed it is negative. It's like saying, uh, defining a Canadian as a non-American. Well, it's not a very good definition because you would exclude the other 194 other nations. Right? So a negative definition is no definition at all. And that was a, a very serious issue. It still is an issue among taxonomists. In the microbial world, Stanier, Dudorov, and Edelberg talk about this prokaryote-eukaryote dichotomy as the greatest discontinuity in the living world. So in a sense, prokaryote-eukaryote as a dichotomy is replacing the plant-animal dichotomy of old, but now at the cellular level, as a great, as the greatest discontinuity in the living world. In the same book in which they articulate the concept of you carry you define the prokaryote negatively. Um, they write the ultimate scientific goal of biological classification cannot be achieved in the case of bacteria. But they still argue, I should mention, in that book, that they think bacteria are monophyletic. They have a common ancestry. They have a common ancestry. But again, no one knows. Immediately people argued, like Alan Elsaw, that maybe this prokaryote eukaryote should be given a greater status in a kingdom, and let's call them super kingdoms. And so they have super kingdoms, prokaryota and eukaryota. Didn't go very far, but it's around. It's around. Robert Whitaker, in 1959, had four kingdoms, the planta, the fungi, the animalia, and the protista. After Stanier and Van Niel's paper in 62, Whitaker argues that there's five kingdoms, that the monera, representing the prokaryotes, would represent a kingdom. These kingdoms, Whitaker was an ecologist at Cornell. He's, these kingdoms, as Eugene uh, uh, Odom, a great ecologist, called them, were functional kingdoms. They weren't kingdoms based on phylogenies. They weren't kingdoms based on genealogies. They weren't kingdoms based on ancestry. For, Whit for Whitaker, they represented the direction of evolution. And he wanted things, you know, fungi represented a kingdom because they were decomposers and they didn't uh, have photosynthesis, so they shouldn't be classified among plants. The protista, everybody complained about that being a kingdom since the day that Heckel used the word, because it was clear to everyone that in that world of protista, it was so diverse that no one knew whether that was a monophyletic, and most people suspected it was highly polyphyletic. So these were these kingdoms that were functional kingdoms. They were kingdoms based on sort of grades, if you will, different levels of organization and the direction of evolution, but not based on evolutionary relationships, not phylogenetics. In fact, Whit Whitaker rejects phylogeny in favor of this evolutionary direction, and he's very explicit about it. He thought, though, that bacteria were monophyletic. Everyone assumed that. Right? There was, they assumed that. But he wasn't sure about the other kingdoms, again, especially the protista. Lynn Margulis adopts Whitaker's five kingdoms in 1971. Previously, she was, uh, in 68, she was supporting four kingdoms. Um, but she had Monra always as a kingdom, um, but not fungi. So she put fungi as a kingdom, and she re-articulated uh, Whitaker's five kingdoms proposing a minor suggestion. But for Lynn, it was also about directionality, it was about symbiosis, and, and, and what the forces were leading to those, those kingdoms. <coughs> for Margulis, the prokaryote carry out dichotomy was really important, and Lynn always told me that. For her, it was a revelation, because now you can understand symbiosis. And that for her, the five kingdom proposal was to replace the plant-animal dichotomy. Very important. The moment you mention five kingdoms, you're now talking about the microbial world and showing diversity in the world. And she thought that the prokaryote eukaryote dichotomy followed from the symbiotic origins of eukaryotes. There was no symbiosis between bacteria, but there were symbiosis uh, between bacteria and eukaryotes in the formation of eukaryotes. So she writes in 1971, Prokaryote and eukaryote reflects remarkably well the evolutionary com, uh, concepts of the symbiotic theory. So she's seeing this very clearly, morphologically, seeing the world morphologically, the same way Stanier and Van Niel are saying it. Always did. Always did. Let me talk, just mention briefly that some background about symbiosis and, and come back to Lynn and her paper in, in, in uh, 1967. The idea, symbiosis 
The symbiotic origin of organelles was pervasive in the 19th century. When Andreas Schoenfeld coined the word chloroplast, he says in the same paper, I wonder if these things are symbiotes. And everyone was, everyone was getting the idea from lichens, the dual nature of lichens, right? Made of a fungi and algae. And uh, they also knew uh, uh, there were lots of uh, uh, protests that had symbionts in them. And so these chloroplasts look like they'd be self reproducing. And, and, and uh, uh, Schimper argued if these things are self reproducing, then we should consider them symbionts. Wataze, a Japanese scientist in Woods Hole in 1893, uh, um, gives a great lecture argue that the nucleus, the cytoplasm, are symbionts, and perhaps also the centrioles. If they are shown to be uh, uh, self-reproducing, then they may be considered to be symbionts as well. Ernst Haeckel, 1904, argued that chloroplasts were, in fact, cyanobacteria, what he called cyanophyse. So these are these are cyanobacteria. Konstantin Merzhkovsky argued between 1905 and 1918 that the nucleus and the cytoplasm were symbionts, and so too the chloroplasts, of course. Paul Poctier, at the Institut Oceanographique in Monaco, wrote a book in 1918, a brilliant book called Les Symbiotes, arguing that symbiosis is a major mode of evolutionary innovation, and that mitochondria were symbionts. Poctier's book was, you know, savaged by the microbiologists at the Institut Pasteur, and by one of the Lumiere brothers, you know, the inventors of film, wrote a book called The Myth des Symbiotes. And the problem was that it conflicted with uh, bacteriologists' concepts of the asepsis of healthy tissue. Right? You couldn't have, a, if these mitochondria are healthy microbes living in healthy tissue, then how could we distinguish between them and rickettsia and other disease causing entities? This would screw up our con conceptions of, of pathology. It was quite clear. And also, Poitier made some outrageous claims, too. Ivan Wallen, in the United States, his book, Symbionticism in the Origin of Species, is very, very similar in many ways uh, with Les Symbiotes, and he had it translated. As a, a, again, a great book, um, horrible word, Symbionticism, you know, not very catchy, but arguing that symbiosis is the uh, mechanism for the origin of species. And that mitochondria were pleomorphic and had entered the cells many, many times, and it was a way of, they were a way of aggrandizing genomes. Right? Very different theories than what came later on. We should be very careful about that, about these sort of precursors, thinking that people have made exactly the same arguments. In fact, quite different. Wallen's idea was mitochondria were coming all the time into organisms aggrandized, and that was the source of new genes. Almost our theories of viral transduction today. Felix Derra according to the word bacteriophage, called bacteriophage microlichens. And the reason for that is he says, here you have these organisms living within organisms. And no one would believe that viruses could live inside uh, bacteria. Félix Derrel was a, a, a French-Canadian and then at, uh, at Yale University. And in 1926 he writes, symbiosis is in large measure responsible for evolution. Well, and again, symbionticism is proposed as a fundamental factor or cardinal principle involved in the origin of species. So what happens to these theories, you know? Because symbiosis is a great window for criticizing and for having a critical perspective on biology in the 20th century. And there's lots of great oppositions of what happened. Everyone knew about these theories. They were always set in the periphery of science. E.B. Wilson discussed them. Everyone knew about them. And there are several problems, it seems to me, and I can pick the, these problems up by the discourse among the biologists themselves when they criticize people who propose these theories. One, of course, is the germ theory of disease. That is very difficult to talk about um, the life-giving properties of bacteria, which in the minds of most biologists and the public were associated with disease. There was a conception of what I call one, one germ plasm, one organism, one genome, one organism, that organisms were defined by one genome. Even the human genome project started. I remember being at Rockefeller University with Josh Lederberg, and we both had a lab. Well, what, which, which genome are they sequencing? You know, the genome. I mean, it's a very complex system. But one genome, one organism, and that became the basis not only of Weismannian uh, conceptions of organisms in the 19th century, but of Mendelian genetics in the 20th century. Right? And this is all based on uh, chromosomes in the nucleus, that there were no other things in the cytoplasm except perhaps parasites. And they were a major mode of evolution. They were something that should be studied by pathologists. 
and that can be documented. And for Mendelian geneticists by the 1930s and 40s, Mendelian gene mutations and recombination within the species are the basis of evolutionary innovation. Zoocentric biology plays a huge role. Huge role. Biology still is zoocentric. Um, I could also mention ever-increasing specialization. The 20th century, the hallmark of biology in the 20th century was ever-increasing specialization. Well, symbiosis, by definition, meant interdisciplinarity. You had to understand microbes, protists, bacteria, at the same time as plants and animals and fungi. And you can pick that up in the discourse, too, because they'll say, oh, this person, you know, uh, with Poitier was a great example, was a great physiologist, but he has no business speaking about bacteria and germ theory. So it just falls in the cracks. You know. And then, of course, the overriding interest in conflict and competition. Symbiosis was typically associated with communism, anti-individualism. Um, again, I remember being at Rockefeller, where I was writing a book called Evolution by Association, which I started uh, with Lynn uh, on sabbatical leave. And, and Josh Lederberg always thought I was political, but I don't think I was. But I said that there's never been a symbiosis meeting in the United States. He said, it's typical for you to say that. I said, no, this is the, this is the home of individualism. You're not going to have this. This is communism. I know it's going to. So he checks and comes back you know, a week later and says, you know, you're right. He said, that's right. He said, they'll happen in Europe through interdisciplinarity. You know, or, and even when Lynn had meetings, they're typically offshore. Right? But the, you know, the, the, so gene theory had the flag wrapped around it. Individualism, well, that's in the Constitution. Um, the tipping point for all this starts in, in 1963 with the discovery of DNA in mitochondria and chloroplasts. In every paper that demonstrated that DNA was in chloroplasts and mitochondria, the conclusion was, I wonder if these things are symbiotes. So everybody knew it was out there. Right? That was the big tipping point. Uh, and also, they had ribosomes. What were they doing then? Maybe these, these old theories are right. Centrioles was the big innovation of that. That maybe, maybe, I mean, in terms of this particular theory, maybe centrioles to and the cytoskeleton emerged from a symbiosis with a spirochete. And Lynn maintained that argument right up to her death. And I'll come back to that in a moment. It was very difficult to test that, though, because you know, the evidence for DNA in centrioles was off and on again throughout most of the 20th century, or the latter part of the 20th century. People thought they actually reproduced. Now we know they don't. One lines up in association with another but they don't reproduce in the same way as mitochondrial chloroplasts. We'll come back to that later on. Lynn writes this amazing paper on the origin of mitosing cells. What's interesting about this paper for me is, is that she puts things in a narrative, in a context. She wants to put things in a, in a, a, um, a microbial, geological, paleontological context. And this was never done before. Telling a story, what might have happened, when and where. Putting a context. An ecological context on things. It's just not studying these things in isolation. But, and I think that's really one of the great, marvelous uh, triumphs. And then writes a book called The Origin of Eukaryotic Cells, which again became a classic as a precursor of symbiosis and cell evolution. But that book, The Origin of Eukaryotic Cells, I mean, that's, that's the book I read when I was an undergraduate. Everybody did. Everybody did. Because don't forget, cell biology and microbiology divorce themselves, those biologists divorce themselves from evolution. Molecular biology too. Molecular biology was primarily an engineering discipline. Primarily an engineering discipline. You pick up a, any microbiology uh, textbook and you're going to get some mention of some mythological story about Lamarck and, and Darwin and how the French guy got it wrong. And, then, and that'll be the last thing you'll hear about evolution in that, in that textbook. Right? For the most part. For the most part. And, 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 and Crick argued as well, which I'll, I'll mention in a moment, use the word we, we decided that we would talk about the origin of cells and the origin of, of, of the genetic code. Lynn's scheme between 1967 and 1981 was the following, and, and it changed afterwards in the, 19, in, in the, 1890, uh, in, sorry, in the 1990s. Uh, in the early story, he thought mitochondria would come in first, then later the spirochetes would create this mitosing cell, and then later on, and then uh, the, uh, the elbow cells uh, um, you know, the cyanobacteria become chloroplasts for plants. But you keep an eye on that, and I'll talk about that later, and we'll see, we'll see her switch a little bit, and then understand why she did that. The problem with these stories was that they're wholly speculative. 
Symbiotic origins of cells are considered outside the realms of empirical science. It was outside of science. It was not certain how it could ever be demonstrated or proven. And then would make arguments that we would, she would never be able to prove it, but that evolutionists were in the same situation as historians. So all we could do is put together plausible scenarios, and the most plausible scenario should win. This is Roger Stanger in 1970. This is what I mean by what cell, how cell biologists themselves, and cell biology textbooks, again, not embedded in evolution, any more than molecular biology books. This is Roger Stanger. It might have happened thus, but we shall surely never know with certainty. He's talking about the symbiotic origin of organelles. Evolutionary speculation constitutes a kind of meta-science. It can be considered a relatively harmless habit, like eating peanuts. Unless it assumes the form of an obsession, then it becomes a vice. You know, Lynn always thought he was writing about her. I think he was, too. But Carl Rose also thinks he was writing about him, too. So everybody's paranoid, you know. But I think it really was about her. What really closed this controversy was molecular phylogenetic uh, data. It really closed the controversy over the origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts once and for all. It's not a theory anymore, it's a fact. This is indisputable as the earth is round, sort of. So let me switch to that, and, and I'm going to introduce Carl Woese, and to, then I'm going to come back and talk about the relationship between uh, Lynn's five kingdoms and, and molecular phylogenetics, and what she thought about molecular phylogenetics and the three domain concept. Molecular phylogenetics was called molecular revolution, which I thought was the wrong word. So, uh, Francis Crick articulates this in, in 1958 when he coined the word cent central dogma. He said, you know, these amino acid sequences are those delicate expressions of evolutionary time. Emil Zuckerkandel and Linus Pauling really put it together though, with the concept of the molecular clock in 1965. Their concept of the clock was that it would be neutral. The clock would tick like this, that there'd be base pair changes uh, that would occur, that were not about adaptation, they weren't responding to phenotypes, and the clock would be have a steady beat. Later people recognized that different molecules kept different beats. And even within a single molecule, you can have one part of that, that nucleic acid sequence that, that's changing very rapidly, another part that's very highly conserved, and others in the middle. Margaret Day off way ahead of her time, she died of cancer. She had, a, and, and Richard Eck, uh, Margaret Tadoff had a, a, a major classification based on amino acid se sequences. But where things really changed is with this man, Carl Woese. Woese came into evolutionary biology and molecular biology from a very different perspective. He was interested in the evolution of the genetic code. Translation. The code for Carl was not those code on assignments you see at the table. The code was process. Very heavily influenced by Whitehead. Ed was then. Red Whitehead. Everything was process, process. But the code for him was all the enzymes were involved in the translation and how that happened. And he thought that, and he's on an original code practice, right? So his question was why does CCC mean proline? Why does UUU mean you're in code phenylalanine? And people like, and his nemesis was Francis Crick. Because Crick argued that the code was an accident, it has no meaning. And it was a frozen accident theory that once the code became like this, it would be very, very, just by accident, by accident, it would become frozen because it would be very difficult to change it. And Carl thought that the code would have to have evolved, that there's meaning in the code, there's a reason for those code on assignments, and he wanted to follow the translation apparatus. TRNA, I mean, these are, these are the first arguments for the RNA world by Carl Wilson in 1967, arguing that tRNA is not just a static, uh, a static adapter, that thing has enzymatic properties, and probably that was the mediator between nucleic acid sequences, RNA, and amino acids. But what he thought was that in order to follow the translation apparatus, remember, a wholly different question than this question, so we have to understand. So his question is, I want to understand how the translation apparatus evolved. I want to understand how the genetic code evolved. In order to do that, he thought, well, maybe he could trace back microbial lineages to some primitive organisms with half-done, you know, translation, uh, genetic systems, microgenetic <laughs> systems. And the way he thought to do that the way he, was to look at the ribosomes. All organisms we know had ribosomes. And so this would be a great indicator. And these things are really sheltered, again, from the vicissitudes of life. This is deep within the translation machinery. And he thought these things would be very highly conserved. And if he could sequence these, 
um, RNAs, maybe there he'd find the ultimate molecular chronometer by which to have big tree. So big tree, big tree of life is to do two things. One was to use a genetic code or the genetic translation apparatus to understand the history of life, the evolutionary relationships of life, but at the same time to use the evolutionary relationships of life to understand the, the evolution of the genetic code. 